So today I'll be talking about one specific type of strategic behavior, and that's manipulation. It's the best studied one. Okay, so let's start with simple examples. So I think this slide is not helping. Let me see. So which one is it? Yep. Okay, so the simplest example is manipulation under plurality voting. So suppose we have these three candidates, A, B, C, and suppose that under truthful voting, so these are the vote counts. And suppose also that ties are broken lexicographically. Okay, so what's happening here? The guys who are voting for C are wasting their vote, right? And because of lexicographic tie-breaking events. Okay, so now suppose one of these guys who votes for C actually has preferences C over B over A. So what is the rational thing for him to do? Well, vote for B instead, right? So she's better off voting B, C, A. So that's a simple example of manipulation. So, and you can argue that this is somewhat benign example of manipulation. Someone is just trying not to waste their vote, right? And of course, under plurality, it's really easy to for her to figure out what to do. So let's see examples of manipulation under more interesting voting rules. Okay, so single transferable vote, in a way, is, was designed to prevent some forms of manipulation. Like in the previous slide, single transferable vote would actually tell that voter to not manipulate vote truthfully, and STV would still transfer her vote to B. But still, on the, even on the STV, manipulation is possible. Okay, so let's look at this election. So say we have four candidates, A, B, C, D. So what happens here is B is the compromise candidate, ranked second by everyone, and he has no first place votes. Okay, what happens in the first round of this election on the STV? B is eliminated, right? Because he has no first place votes whatsoever. Okay, and let's say now that tie-breaking is lexicographic. A over B over C over D, meaning if, if, the votes if the vote counts are equal, D is eliminated first, then C, then B. Okay, so suppose now we eliminated B, who is the next one to go out? D, right? So, and when D goes out, so where does his vote go? Right, so B is no longer there, so this vote that used to be for D transfers to C. Right, so this is what happens. Now C has two votes, two out of three, right? His original vote and this new vote. So C now has two votes and C is the election winner. Okay, so who can manipulate? Who doesn't really like this outcome of C winning? Well, look at the first guy, he really doesn't like C. What can he accomplish? Well, one thing he can do is to make sure that B doesn't disappear kind of immediately in the very first round, right? He can give B a chance, right? So suppose he votes B, A, C, D instead. B, A, okay, so I have a typo, but it doesn't matter. So his first vote is B. So now what happens? Who drops out first? D, right? D drops out first, right? And the guy who voted for D had B as his second option. So now B has two votes and B is the election winner, right? So this first guy didn't manage, okay, so he didn't manage to make his favorite candidate a winner. That would be a tall call. But at least he now has B as the election winner, which is something that he prefers to see. Right, so he improved the outcome from his perspective. Okay, and that, okay, so that was a clever manipulation. I think for plurality, you immediately saw who could do what. He takes a little bit more time to figure out, but still a manipulation is possible. So I believe, so I looked up in, looked, uh, tried to look it up in the literature. So apparently there is an example of a local election in the United States where STV was used, and this type of manipulation would have been possible. It didn't actually happen, but it would have been possible given the preferences, right? So it's not completely unrealistic. Okay, so now given that, okay, so we've seen these two examples. So gibbard satterthwaite theorem was briefly mentioned yesterday. gibbard satterthwaite theorem says, okay, so you cannot really hope to avoid manipulation altogether. So any voting rule that, okay, A is not a dictatorship, B can elect any of the any of the candidates who are present, and there are at least three of them, and kind of any such rule, there exists a list of voters' preferences such that some voter has an incentive to manipulate. So meaning a voter can change his vote so that the winner is a candidate whom he ranks higher than the original winner. So that's the bad news. So in a way, I would argue that this is perhaps more fundamentally bad news than arrows and possibility result. Somewhat contrary to what Neil was saying yesterday, I think this is a more damning result for social choice. Because if you think about it, arrows impossibility theorem relies on independence of relevant alternatives 
which is, well, it's a nice axiom to have, but it feels very strong. And here, the assumptions are really minimal. So there have to be at least three candidates, and Giroux is not a dictatorship, right? That's really very little to ask for, right? And yet, kind of manipulation is possible. Okay, so now we can wear our computer scientist hats and ask, well, does computational complexity perhaps pr give us some hope? So here's the reasoning. So suppose we know all votes, so I'm the potential manipulator, I know all other votes, I know the voting rule. Uh, can I figure out if I have a successful manipulation? So for plurality, it's sort of obvious that I have, right? right basically, I have to see kind of who is tied at the top and if I, if I can make one of these guys the unique winner or something like that, close to that. Right? For single transferable vote, it takes more cleverness. For the voting rules we discussed, well, perhaps also it takes a substantial amount of cleverness. So perhaps if we try to formalize this idea of cleverness, well, maybe it turns out that for some voting rules, manipulation is polynomial time and therefore easy. And for some voting rules, perhaps manipulation is NP hard. Right, and if that's the case, NP hardness is actually our friend. NP hardness is good news, or at least somewhat good news, because it means that it's, fi it's hard for the manipulator to figure out what to do, at least in the worst case. So maybe he won't be able to figure out what that manipulation is, so maybe he won't be able to manipulate, right? So that's the idea of NP hardness as protection against manipulation, right? So that's an image by my co-author, Piotr Filoshevsky, who, who likes to think about this, you know, NP hardness dragon protecting collections from manipulation. Okay, so, so this is a research agenda that was proposed by Bertoldi, Tovi, and Trick in 1989. And the hope was, okay, so maybe plurality really is too simple, but if you look at more sophisticated voting rules, maybe they are actually and be hard to manipulate. But in fact, in that same paper, Bertoldi, Tovi, and Trick uh, dealt a pretty heavy blow to that research agenda. Okay, so let me first give you the computational setup. So what is the manipulation problem? How do we define it formally to reason about its hardness? Well, uh, okay, so here's what we have. We assume that manipulator is voter N, the last voter. He observes the ballots of the first N minus one voters, so he needs complete information about those. And he has a preferred candidate C. And the voting rule F is known. So voting rule is, well, it's not part of the input, but kind of we have this problem, we have this question for every voting rule. And now the question is, can this voter, voter N, vote so as to make this candidate C win under rule F. Uh, so you may notice that this is somewhat different from how we actually ask this question under gibbard satterthwaite right? Under gibbard satterthwaite we assume that this last voter has a preference order and he compares what would happen under truthful voting and what happens under manipulation. But this is different because we, we don't endow N here with a preference order. We just say that N has a specific candidate whom he wants to make the election winner. Right, so this turns out to be slightly more convenient to handle from the computational perspective. Okay, so in fact, so when I said to make C win, uh, so this was slightly imprecise. So there are two flavors of this problem. So one is, can I make, suppose I, suppose I have a voting rule, a classic voting rule like plurality and border, and I don't want to fix a tie-breaking rule. I don't want to say that my tie-breaking is lexicographic or anything like that. So then there may be ties. So, and if there may be ties, I may have two distinct goals. One of them is to make this special candidate the unique winner of the election, so that he wins and he is not even tied with anyone for winning. And the other option is to make him one of the tied winners. Right, so these are two different computational questions. Turns out that they typically have the same complexity. If you have algorithm for one, you have an algorithm for another. If you have hardness result for one, you have hardness result for the other. But still, kind of to be careful, we have to state those as two kind of distinct computational problems. If you think of them as kind of tie-breaking, you can think of this as our voter is very pessimistic about the tie-breaking rule. Our voter doesn't know what the tie-breaking rule is, and he expects that it may be actually adversarial to his candidate, right? So to make his candidate win, he, can make he has to make sure there are no ties, right? And this is an optimistic manipulator who thinks that if there is a tie, the candidate will be the one chosen among the tied candidates, right? So this is lexicographic tie order favoring this guy, see? Okay. So, okay, so this is what I started saying. Uh, how is this problem related to kind of original form of manipulation under Gibbard Satterthwaite? Well, if you can solve this form of manipulation, if you can figure out this question, then you can decide if you have an improving manipulation. Why? Well, look at the candidate winning on the truthful voting. Suppose this is some guy W. 
right? And then look at every candidate you rank above W. And for each of these candidates, you can ask this question. Can you make that candidate winner under your voting rules? And if for any one of them the answer is yes, if for any one of them there is an improving manipulation, if for any one of them there is manipulation, then you have an improving manipulation. You can make someone you prefer to the current winner to win the election. Right? So effectively, kind of, if you can do this, you can do that. And hardness has also also translate. So that's basically the same question. Yes. Yes, so the voting rule itself is polytime. So it's not, right, so it's not particularly interesting to ask this question for the rule that is not polytime. Well, because, well, kind of, you don't really reason. If you, if, you, if, you, if you consider it acceptable to have an NP hard voting rule for your application, then maybe in the context of your application, NP hardness really is not a barrier to anything, maybe because instances are small. Right, so this is indeed, this is what we consider for efficiently computable voting rules. Okay, but yeah, thanks, this is a useful remark. Okay, so something else to note here. The manipulation problem is easy if the number of candidates is small, right? So if you're dealing with three candidates and you have to find a beneficial manipulation, one thing you can do is to go over all possible votes, right? If you have three candidates, you have three factorial equals to six votes to consider. If you have four candidates, you have 24 votes to consider. Maybe slightly painful to do by hand, but still not invisible. Right, so these problems are computationally interesting in the sense that we can them. I'm going to present it for a scoring crew, right? So a scoring crew, one that assigns scores to candidates based on their positions. And then we'll see that this is actually generalized beyond scoring groups. Okay, so suppose I'm the manipulator. I know everyone else's preferences and I know the scoring crew. So I'm going to create my manipulative vote as follows. So I want to make candidate seven. I'm operating on the scoring crew. There is no reason not to rank my preferred candidate first. Right, this is definitely the best I can do. The interesting part is how I, how I rank the remaining candidates. But my preferred candidate definitely should go first. Okay, so I put him first. Now I know his final score. Right, I know the, the points he gets from everyone else. I know the points he gets from me, the maximum number of points. So I know his score. Now let me look at the scores of all other candidates. They don't, they don't have any points from me as yet, but they have some points they received from other candidates. So let me look at their scores. Now, if any other candidate is already beating my candidate, well, okay, so that will remain the case, right? So scoring vectors are non-negative, so they're only, to, they're only going to get more points from me, well, best case, zero, but possibly more, right? So if someone is already beating my candidate, I have to give up, right? I don't have a manipulated vote in favor of C, I have no chance, right? So, so but suppose this is not the case. Suppose currently C has the highest score. But the danger is, as I keep ranking other candidates, I'm giving them further points, so maybe they're going to beat my guy, my guy, right, because of my vote. So I have to be extra careful when I rank these remaining candidates. Okay, so here's what I do. I look at the second position in my vote, and I try to, try to see which candidates can be placed into that, that second position so that they still don't beat my preferred candidate C. Why can I do that? Well, if I place someone in that second position, I can immediately compute what their score is going to be. Right? And for some candidates, this is, some candidates can be placed there, some candidates cannot be. So suppose someone can be placed there safely. So let me just, in the sense that if I place him in that position, he doesn't beat my candidate. So let me just do that. So let me just place him in that position and continue. Right? So now for the third position, I see if someone can be safely placed there and know that if someone could be safely placed in the second position, I can still pl place them safely in the third position because my score vector is decreasing or non-increasing, right? So if someone was safe in the previous iteration, he remains safe, right? So, my sa so I keep doing that. So at each point, if I have a safe candidate, I place them in the position, right? If I, if I run out of safe candidates, this means it's slightly trickier, but if you think about it for a second, you'll see that this actually means that I didn't have any chance to start with. So if I ran out of safe candidates to place, right, then I simply didn't have enough, candi enough safe candidates for those top positions, right? And in that case, I report failure. Right? Okay, so this is how I construct my vote. So if I manage to get to the last position, if I manage to place all candidates safely so that they don't beat my guy, maybe they tie with him, but they don't beat him, then I have a safe, then I have a manipulative vote. And if I failed at any point, this means not just that this specific procedure failed, this means that actually a manipulative vote doesn't exist. So this is somewhat more subtle. I'm not proving it formally, 
Uh, but I think it should be intuitively clear and it can be proved kind of as homework if you think about it for a minute. Okay, so this is how manipulative vote can be constructed. This is very clearly polynomial, right? Kind of a simple iterative procedure. I presented it as a procedure for scoring rules, but actually it goes beyond scoring rules. Okay, so remember Copeland rule, right? So you get a point for each pair by selection you win, 0.5 for each pair by selection you lose. So I argue that actually the very same algorithm works. So again, I can place my preferred candidate in the first position, and if I do that, I know his Copeland score. Because I know, okay, so, I, so for all other candidates, I know how he's, pla how he's placed with respect to those candidates in other votes, and in my vote, he's placed above everyone else. So I can figure out whom he beats with whom he ties. Right, so all I need to know is that he's the first in my vote. That gives me all the pairwise comparisons. Okay, so I know his Copeland score. Now think about filling out position two. If I attempt to put someone in position two, at that point, I'm going to know their Copeland score. Again, because I know kind of how they compare to all other candidates in all other votes, and I know how they compare to all other candidates in my vote. They're below candidate one, and they're above everyone else. Right, so I know all of their pairwise comparisons, so I know their Copeland score. So again, I can figure out who is safe to place in position two, who is not. Right, and in a similar way, so once I filled out the first i minus one positions, if I try to place someone in position i, I can compute their Copeland score. I know who is above them, I know who is below them. Right, so I can do the same algorithm. Okay, and similarly for Maximin, again, the same procedure works. And it works because once I filled out the prefix of length i minus one, and I try to put candidate in position i, I can compute their Maximin score. Again, if you don't really remember the definition of maximum, and I don't remember you do, uh, so that would take probably some time to prove, but it's easy. Once you have the definition in front of you, this is something you can prove. Right, so again, this algorithm is not just an algorithm for scoring rules, so it's an algorithm for a family of rules. I could try to define it formally, what properties do I want the voting rule to have for this to work, but for us, it's enough to know that it works for all scoring rules and for a couple of things that are not scoring rules. Right, but yeah, so basically things defined based on scores where you can do this sequential thing. Right, so this means that even fairly sophisticated voting rules like Copeland, Maxim, and Borda don't offer us computational co protection for manipulation. Right, so these rules can be manipulated easily in the sense of polynomial time. Yes? Yeah, so one vote is trying to manipulate, he knows everyone else's votes and the voting rule. Right, so he's, he's trying to manipulate in favor of a particular guy. He's trying to vote so as to make a particular guy a winner, and he's slowly constructing his vote. So that does it up. Okay. Okay, so I presented this is for core winner problem, but in fact for the unique winner problem, it's basically the same. Just that when you place candidate, you have to make sure they're safe in the sense of unique winner. Right, your guy remains unique winner when you place these new guys. Okay, does this work for STV? Well, STV is not even based on scores, right? And if you think about it, kind of once you place a candidate in a position, right, it doesn't necessarily mean you can compute what STV is going to do to him, right? So this procedure doesn't seem to be relevant. So in fact, we have argued that STV is not monotone, and because STV is not monotone, we cannot even start by placing our preferred guy first. That's not necessarily the best thing, right? Because of non monotonicity and in fact, Interestingly, so here is where we have a glimmer of hope. Manipulation under the single transferable vote is actually NP hard, right? And the, okay, so, so there was a question of whether this framework is actually applicable to rules that are not polynomial time computable and STV is sort of in this gray area. Well, okay, so let me clarify. Suppose we even we do STV where we do lexicographic tie breaking at every round, right? So we assume all ties are broken lexicographically. We are not trying to explore all these possible branches of STV that depend on elimination order, right? So we just do deterministic STV with single winner, right? And this is easy, right? So even for that easy version of STV, manipulation is NP hard, right? So this is a voting rule where winner determination is easy, but manipulation is hard. So at least in some sense, we have some protection against manipulation, right? So that was sort of big news back then, right? And it seemed like a good argument in favor of STV. Again, not something that came up in the alternative vote debate in the UK, but then I would expect that to be too esoteric for most voters. Okay, so how, okay, how important is this result? Is STV actually resistant to manipulation in practice? Well, people try to look into that. 
So there's a library of preference data called Preflib that collects kind of various preference data, some from elections, some are things like people ranking different kinds of sushi according to their tastes. So kind of very diverse preference data. And researchers try to find STV manipulations in that data set. Well, it turns out that in that data set, usually STV manipulations, when they exist, are easy to find. So basically, there's a couple of heuristic algorithms that are very fast and very successful. So to what extent this whole line of thought about NP hardness providing protection against manipulation, to what extent it's valid in the context of voting manipulation is not completely clear. But okay, so this STV just happens to be like that. So that was a pointer that maybe for STV we have a chance that it's really hard in practice. Well, further research heuristics show that this doesn't seem to be quite true. But I mean, that doesn't invalidate the research agenda. Maybe for another voting rule, one could prove hardness, right? And then that hardness would actually kind of tell you, uh, would actually resist kind of also practical attempts to circumvent it. Right, so as a first step, distinguishing easy and hard to manipulate voting rules, trying to understand whether a manipulation problem is polynomial time or NP hard is still useful. Okay, so, okay, so that was manipulation by a single voter. Well, manipulation by a single voter, you can argue that it's not even that important in practice. Right? So if you think about elections in a large constituency, it's very unlikely that any single voter actually has any impact on the result. Whether they're truthful or, stay, or even staying home or manipulating in the most clever way, chances are a voter alone just cannot do anything. So the really interesting question is, what happens if a coalition of voters manipulates? Okay, so how do we formalize it? Well, the coalition of manipulation problem, well, we, let's say, so here kind of the Gibbard set a type of model where all these manipulators have to improve, becomes really hard to formalize. Because if you have a group of manipulators, potential manipulators, with actual preferences, well, first they have to figure out which candidate to manipulate in favor of. So it seems like even among them, there has to be an election over potential winning candidates and they have to select someone. So we are sort of back to square one, we are back to preference aggregation. Right? So it's sort of complicated to define. So what researchers did, kind of, what researchers did to have a clear, well-defined computational problem, they said the following. So suppose we have a group of, say, K voters, and they have a specific candidate C. So here, this kind of variant where we look at just a specific goal, making specific candidates win, uh, this is really helpful to have a clean setup. So we have a specific candidate. We have ballots of all other remaining N minus K voters. And now the question is whether our K guys can vote so as to make C a winner on the voting group. So again, co-winner, unique winner, so both questions can be asked legitimately, tend to have the same complexity. Okay, so what is the computational complexity of that if you have a coalition of manipulators? And here, something interesting turns out to happen. Okay, so first let's, okay, let's think about our easiest voting rule, plurality. Suppose you have a coalition of voters. What should voters in that coalition do? Suppose they want to make C winner, right? It's plurality voting. Well, there's really nothing clever they can do. They can vote for C, right? So there's nothing beyond that that they can attempt. Kind of being clever doesn't seem to be helpful. Okay, so plurality coalition manipulation is easy. Well, let's try to go a little bit about plurality. Let's say we have two approvals, right? So this means each of our voters has to vote for two candidates. They want to make C a winner. Of course, they would want to vote for C, but they also have to vote for some other guy. Okay, so how do they go about that? Well, again, we have to reason about which votes are safe, which votes are not, right? So suppose everyone in that manipulating coalition, well, votes for C. And let's also suppose that before manipulation, each candidate X gets some amount S X points. Okay, so what do we know about our guy? Well, okay, so now we are the manipulators. The K of us, we all vote for him. So he gets K plus C of C points. K from us and C, S of C was his previous score. Now let's look at every other guy. So his score was S of X. So there should be at most that many of us voting for him, right? Because if there are that many of us voting for him, together with the SX points he already has, his score will be at most SC plus K, right? And that means he won't beat our guy. Now, of course, if this quantity is already negative, right? So it may be the case that this quantity is already negative, right? This means that no matter what happens, someone already is beating our guy, right? So all of us voted for C, but someone else already has a higher score. 
right? So we have no chance, right? And in that case, of course, we give up. But of course, if all these quantities yeah, are non-negative, right? So this says, okay, at most zero of us maybe can vote for that guy. At most five of us can vote for this guy. At most seven of us can vote for that guy, right? And we simply look at these numbers and see kind of if kind of V manipulators can be split so that not too many of us vote for one competitor, not too many of us vote for another competitor, not too many of us vote for the third competitor, right? So each of us votes for our preferred guy and one of the competitors and we coordinate so as not to give any of the competitors too many votes and we know what these thresholds are, right? This is what they are. Yeah? Non-manipulators, right. Let's see, okay, so k is the overall number, k is the overall number of manipulators, right? So what I'm saying, so c score before manipulation was s of c, right? So with our votes, his score is now this, right? So this is the score of our guy, right? Right, so we want to make, okay, so maybe I didn't write it in the clearest way possible, so maybe a picture would have been more helpful, but the point is, Okay, so we all vote for C, we know what C score is going to be, so we want to kind of give extra votes to others so that no one beats C, right? And whatever the math is, well, it's something like that, right? But every single finite score is a plus K is the final score, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that goes a bit beyond two approval, but it doesn't go too far. Okay, so in the, so, what is, we do know that collational manipulation is actually NP hard for the more interesting voting holes. So even for Borda and also for Copeland and Maximin, right? And of course for STV, because for STV it's hard even with a single voter. What is interesting here though, is that you don't need lots of manipulators for this to hold, right? Each of these hardness results holds even with two manipulation, manipulators. So for a single manipulator, we have this greedy algorithm Right, and even if you just have two guys and they have to coordinate the efforts, and I mean two guys, I mean, it really kind of isn't much to ask for. Even for two guys, manipulation is hard. Okay, so Neil was planning to discuss the proof for Borda in her tutorial, right, so I'm not going to go there, but that proof has an interesting history. So there are two papers that discovered that proof and pretty, they discovered pretty much the same proof, essentially simultaneously. So there are two major AI conferences, AAAI and Ichikai, so in the year 2011, they had, they had the submission deadlines like two weeks apart from each other. And one paper was submitted to one conference, the other paper was submitted to the other conference. What made it interesting is that Toby Walsh, who, was the, who is the co-author here, was actually a program chair of this conference, right? So that made for a very interesting con conflict of interest. And I, I've heard from Toby how he handled it. He handled it in the best possible way, right? So the, and I mean, both results definitely deserve to be published in the respective conferences. I think one of them got the best paper award in its conference, I don't remember which one. But yeah, so this is something that has been open for easily for five, six years. People deeply cared about the problem, hardness of border manipulation, right? And yet, two teams discovered it essentially simultaneously. These things sometimes happen. Okay, now that we are talking about coalitional manipulation, so something that is interesting in the context of coalitional manipulation is weighted voters, right? And there may be reasons to having weighted voters. For instance, if you think of parliamentary voting, it sometimes makes sense to think of a party as a voter, right? Not a single member of a parliament, but, but a party, right? If there's strong party discipline, right? And then the weight of a party is the number of parliament members, right? Or if you think about shareholder voting, right? The power of a single voter is the number of shares that he or she has, right? So again, we are in the context of weighted votes. So what is the difficulty, okay, so what is the complexity of manipulation with weighted voters? Well, if you talk about not coalitional manipulation, but a single manipulator, having weights actually makes no difference. Uh, it makes no difference because if you think about our greedy algorithm, well, if all, it works in exactly the same way, right? So our manipulator will have weight. So we'll have to, all the computations we do, we have to do, we have to do them with weights, but they're still the same computations. They don't get any more complex. What, what is interesting though is if you have a coalition of manipulators, right? If you have multiple manipulators, then with weights, manipulation may become hard even for a small number of candidates. Remember we said if you have a single manipulator, uh, then uh, if a number of candidates is bounded by a constant, then manipulation is easy. We go over all possible manipulations. 
Now, even suppose we don't have weights. Suppose we have, say, two manipulators and a constant number of candidates. Again, we can go over all possible coalitional manipulative votes, right? So this is still easy. But if we have weights, here's what happens. Uh, well, if you have multiple manipulators and weights, here's what happens. Well, okay, plurality is still easy. There are, very, the, there are very few computational problems that are hard for plurality. Well, we'll see some, but that's not one of them. Right, so coalitional manipulation, okay, weighted coalitional manipulation, whatever, they st st still vote for the preferred candidate. Right, so weights don't change that. But now suppose we have some other voting rule, like a more interesting voting rule. Then successful manipulation may have this flavor that, you know, by voting, we, c we all vote for a candidate, but by our votes, we're also helping somewhat other candidates. And we maybe we have to be careful in how we distribute our weights. Right? That much of our weight goes to help this candidate. That much of our weight goes to help that candidate. That much of our weight goes to help that candidate. So in particular, we may have to split our weight very carefully, so in particular in equal parts. Right? And splitting our weight in equal parts, so if you're a large coalition of manipulators, then the classic and be hard partition problem, and partition is hard. Right? So that gives you a sense that kind of weighted, weighted coalition of manipulation may be hard for a small number of candidates. Right, so let me give you a specific hardness reduction for the border rule. I'm going to show that weighted coalition manipulation is NP-complete under border even if we only just have three candidates. Okay, so here's how the construction goes. So we, if we do some partition, let me formally define partition. Partition problem, we have T numbers, T integer non-negative numbers that sum up to 2K. So the sum is even. And the, our question is, is the subset of these numbers so that if we sum not all numbers but over that subset, then the sum is exactly k. Meaning, can we split these two numbers into two subsets with equal sum? Okay, so that's a classic NP hard problem, and we are going to reduce it to our problem, to finding weighted coalition manipulation on the border. So let's say we have these three candidates, A, B, and P. P, it stands for preferred, here's our preferred guy. So and let's say we have, okay, so we, have a, we are a coalition of manipulators, but there are also two truthful voters, just two. And one truthful voter votes A over B over P and his weight is 3K. And another voter votes B over A over P, weight 3K. Right? And remember, we are doing border rule. So let's compute the scores of all candidates. Okay, P obviously gets zero, no one likes P. So what's the score of A? A gets two points from this, from this guy. Right, and this guy's weight is 3K, so that's 6K points because of the weight. And A gets one point from this guy, his weight is 3K, so the total weight is 9K, and symmetrically for B. Right, so you can see A and B are completely symmetric, so both get 9K points. And on top of that, we have our coalition of manipulators. Right, so it will be a coalition with one manipulator for each number in the instance of partition. Right, and if the number is AI, the weight is going to be 3AI. And now we're asking if our manipulators can vote so as to make P, candidate P, a co-winner on the border. Okay, so let's look at it, let's look at it again, right? So this is our setup. Okay, what should our manipulators do? Well, they should all rank P first, right? That's pretty obvious. If they rank P first, their total weight is three times 2K, so those AI sum up to 2K, so that would be 6K, 6K weight, Ranking P first, each of them gives him two points, so that's 12K points. 12K, of course, is very good, so that beats 9K, but now recall that each one of our manipulator's votes would also rank A or B first, so it would also give some extra points to A or B. Right, so that's the difficulty. Right, so the manipulators basically have to choose between voting P, A, B, and P, B, A. Right, these are the two meaningful choices. Right, and one gives extra points to A, one gives extra points to B. So what do we know? So what can we say about it? So these are the two votes. Suppose, actually, we start with the yes instance of partition, and then we can split into groups of weight 3K each. Right, so that corresponds to kind of having a subset of, subset of AIs that sum up to K, right, since weights are a factor of three, we have a group of weight 3K. Right, so suppose we do that. So what are the scores then? Well, like we said, P gets 12 points, but then A gets extra 3K points from the first group, and B gets extra 3K points from the other group, so everyone has a score of 12K, right? So in particular, our guy is a co-winner. Good. 
Okay, so if you have a yes instance of partition, we have a yes instance of our problem. Now suppose we have a no, yes, no instance of partition. So we cannot have this nice split. Well, as you can see, these guys basically have six k points to distribute between A and B, right? Because A and B have to put in the second position, right? So the six, six k units of vote weight that goes to A or B. If we cannot split it evenly, one of them will get strictly more than three k, right? And if one of them gets strictly more than 3K, they will have that amount plus 9K points they have from truthful voters, will have strictly more than 12K, right? And P cannot have more than 12K, right? So if there is no even split, we'll give too many points either to A or to B, so one of them will beat our guy P, right? So a successful manipulation that makes P a core winner exists if and only if there is an even split of our set of numbers. Okay, so even with three Okay, so even with three candidates, then weighted cholesterol manipulation is computationally hard. Right, and that works for border, but pretty much for any non-trivial voting rule, you can cook up a similar reduction. Something with three candidates, reduction from partition, those are usually not difficult to construct. Right, if you want a homework exercise, do it for Maximino Copeland. Right, I wouldn't be surprised if exactly the same construction works, but well, something very similar certainly works. Okay, questions about that? Okay, I sort of expected someone to complain that this is weak NP hardness because it's reduction from partition. And indeed, if the weights are small, if the weights are polynomially bounded, you can do this by dynamic programming, but we sort of prefer to think of weights as being large, kind of weights given in binary. So this is still a hardness result. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about constructive manipulation. We've been talking about our manipulators working to make a candidate an election winner. Well, you can also talk about manipulators who want to prevent a candidate they hate from winning. So there's a very cute paper that elaborates on this idea, not in the context of manipulation, in the context of control that we're going to talk about later. This paper is called Anyone But Him, right? So suppose kind of you have a candidate that you really, really don't want to win the election. So you coordinate your efforts as a team to make sure that that candidate doesn't win. Right, so take your favorite guy, your favorite candidate who elicits strong feelings from the electorate. Take Donald Trump, for instance. Right, so how can voters who don't like Trump but otherwise have diverse political views, how can they collectively vote to defeat Trump? Right, seems like a reasonable question. Sometimes it doesn't matter so much which of the reasonable candidates wins. You really want to make sure that the unreasonable candidate doesn't win. Okay, so what is the complexity of that? Well, for one thing, uh, so destructive manipulation is actually somewhat easier than constructive manipulation, or at least it's not harder. So here's a formal statement that you can make. Suppose that constructive, for the constructive manipulation, core winner problem is easy. So it's easy to figure out how to make a given candidate an election core winner. Right? So for whatever candidate you take, it's easy to figure out if he can be made an election core winner. Then destructive manipulation is easy for a unique winner. Right, so it's not a clean reduction. I'm not saying that if constructive manipulation is easy, so is destructive manipulation. Right, so I need these qualifiers about core winner and unique winner. But it's a technicality because for all manipulation problems I know, core winner and unique winner have the same complexity. Just that the reduction really needs to talk about those two. So it's an easy reduction. So does anyone want to tell me kind of why this is the case? If I can easily make someone core winner, I can figure out how to prevent someone from being a unique winner. So why? Right, so I have this guy D. I have to make sure he is not the unique winner. What do I do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. So for every other candidate, everyone other than this guy I hate, I'm checking if I can make kind of this alternative guy a core winner. Right. If I can, then by doing so, I prevent kind of Donald Trump from being the unique winner. Right. So that's exactly the strategy. Right. So. If you try to think about replacing core winner, unique winner here with other things, it doesn't quite work, but like I said, it's a technicality, right? Because, well, if you have the easiness result for constructive manipulation for core winner, you have it for unique winner. Okay, interestingly, the converse is not true. So it genuinely is the case that destruction is easier than construction. Okay, what else is surprising? Okay, so here is one example. So here's an example where destructive is easier than constructive. Think about the Vita rule. Vita rule is a scoring rule where you give one point to every candidate except the candidate you rank in the last position. So you can think of it as vetoing the candidate you dislike most. 
And then the candidate with fewest vetoes wins, right? So co-winners are the candidates who are ranked last the smallest number of times, have the fewest vetoes. So let's try to think about the complexity of veto manipulation. So first, okay, and let's talk about weighted veto with three candidates. So first, suppose you want to make a given guy win, right? So you want him to be someone with the smallest number of vetoes, right? Or if you want him to be a co-winner, you want him to have, you know, smallest or equal number of vetoes. Then using a reduction very similar to one we've seen for Borta, you can show that it's NP hard. Basically, you set, up, you set it up so that your guy already has like a large number of vetoes, right? You don't want to give him any new vetoes, but you want to split vetoes be between the other two guys so that both of them are tied with your guy. Because if, if you are not splitting it equally, one of them will get fewer vetoes than your guy, so he will be the winner. So you have these two other guys that you want to give your vetoes to, right? And it has to be equal because otherwise one of them gets too few. Right, so it's hard. Now suppose you, okay. So constructive manipulation is hard. Destructive manipulation, though, is easy. So why is it easy? Right, so there's someone you hate, you have a coalition, there's someone you hate, what should your coalition do? Veto him, right? I mean, that's the only meaningful thing you can do. Right, so it's like plurality but reversed. Kind of constructive for plurality is like destructive for veto. Right, so destructive is genuinely easy. Right, so that's a nice illustration how one is formally NP hard, the other is formally easy. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about this unique winner, co-winner problem. So that was like circumventing the issue of tie breaking. Well, so oh, like I said in the beginning, co-winner is like optimistic tie breaking. You believe that your guy will win in any tie. Uh, unique winner is pessimistic tie breaking. Well, one thing you can also reason about is randomized tie breaking, right? So this is actually some work I did with my PhD, my then PhD student Svetlana Obrastsova, right? So I'm finally getting to talk about my own work as well. Okay, so suppose winner is chosen among tight candidates uniformly at random. What does it even mean to have a successful manipulation? Well, let's think about it. So plurality, let's say we have this setup. Before you vote, A has five points, B has five points, C has four points. And now you are the manipulator, you haven't voted yet, you come in, your preferences are C over B over A. What can you do? You can vote truthfully and that will make for a three-way tie. Right, and ties are broken uniformly at random, so it will be A, B, C, each of those wins with probability three. The other option you have is, okay, you can give an extra point to A, you probably don't want to, you don't like A, but you can give an extra point to B. You can make B the unique winner, right? So that's an option you have, right? It's not your most preferred guy, but it's still someone you don't dislike, right? It's your second most preferred guy, right? So you have to compare whether you prefer B as a unique winner or three way tie A, B, C. It's not an obvious choice, right? So it's not clear what a successful manipulation even means if, you, if, you, if the only information you have about manipulation is that there's CBA. Right. Okay, so the way this is usually handled is we assume that manipulators have utilities for all possible alternatives, right? And then the answer really depends on what these utilities are. Suppose I really care about C. C is not just my top guy, but really C gives me 10 utils, B just two and A zero. Then if I have a three-way tie, right, then my expected utility from that tie is 10 plus two plus zero over three, so this is four, right? So four versus just getting two utils from B. So the tie is better for me. Tie gives my preferred candidate C a good chance. I really care about C, right? So my expected utility is better in a tie. On the other hand, suppose that I actually like I like C, but I also like B quite a lot, right? So B, B is decent, and I still dislike A. Right, so then a three-way tie gives me an expected utility of 10 plus eight plus zero over three, so this is six, right? And then B gives me eight, so eight is better than six. If my utilities are like that, I should really favor B. Right, so you cannot, so without utilities, you cannot know which manipulation is successful. So suppose we're given those utilities. So now my, my manipulation problem becomes, yeah? Oh, uh, yeah, so you can solve an equation, right? So if you fix the utility of C at 10, utility of A at zero, or if you want to normalize one zero, so you can solve the equation and it will be, yeah, so it will be just one breakpoint. I'd rather not do it now in, in the interest of time, but you can. 
Okay, so now the manipulation problem becomes, so suppose you have all these utilities, so you have the voting tool, you have again everyone else's vote, can you figure out the beneficial manipulation? And again, you can ask the, the question for all voting tools. Okay, let's ask it for plurality. So for plurality, it boils down the following. So let's look at the set of candidates with the highest score, and let that score be S. So now let's look at the set of guys who are just one point below. So this set may be empty, so perhaps maybe all candidates you have are tied for winning, that's a possibility, right? Or maybe, well, there are some candidates with the top score and everyone else is far below, but maybe actually you have this set, right? So it may or may not be empty. So here, if that's the setting, here are the options you have as a manipulator under plurality. You can look at your most preferred candidate among the top scorers and you can give your point to them, right? That turns that candidate from being a core winner to being the unique winner. Right, so you can make sure that this is the unique person with the highest score among those in D. Right? Or you can look at your favorite guy in N, provide, provided that N is non-empty, and you can bring up their score to S. You can give them one extra point so that they, they are among the core winners. Right? And in that way, right, you have a large tight set which will include everyone in T plus your preferred guy in N. Right, so that would make sense if this guy in N is someone you really like more than all these guys in T. Right, so that, these are basically the two options you have. If you vote for anyone else, that will not help that guy. Right, so either you go for your, so intuitively, either you go for your favorite guy in T and you make them the unique winner, or you go for your favorite guy in N and you make him the core winner together with these guys. Right, so you have these two options, so you have to compare them, right, and you have to figure out which one is better for you. Right, so this is polynomial time. So it's slightly trickier than kind of that on the lexicographic tie breaking, but still not too complicated. So in fact, if you try to extend this idea to border, it becomes somewhat more complex because now you're giving points to a lot of different people, but still not, more, not much more complex. So the theorem we have is that in fact for all scoring rules, this sort of argument works. So manipulation on randomized tie breaking is polynomial time. So for scoring rules, it's still easy. Interestingly, if you now look at Copeland and Maximin, which are like the other popular voting rules being studied, then you have NP completeness, right? So if you look at randomized tie breaking, actually scoring rules shine as being easy to manipulate, or maybe well, depending how you look at it, so they're good or bad, right? But Copeland and Maximin turn out to be difficult. So another interesting twist, I don't have it in the slides, but if you assume that your utilities are such that you have utility of one for one guy, utility zero for everyone else, then for maximum there is an algorithm, right? If you really just care about one guy and you want him to win, then for maximum there is an algorithm, but it's far from trivial, right? So that's kind of a substantial combinatorial effort to get it. But for general utilities, maximum is hard, right? So maximum is interesting that way. Okay, so that was randomized tie breaking. So in the remaining, well, five minutes really, but I think that's enough. So I want to talk a little bit about the setting where not just one voter, but many voter strategize. Okay, so if you think about, if you think about Gibbard Satisfied theorem, well, basically it deals with settings where there's only one strategic voter. So there is this manipulator, he assumes that he knows how everyone else votes, so he effectively assumes that everyone else is truthful. Right, so that's a pretty ambitious assumption to make. Right, so kind of assuming that you're smarter than everyone else. Right, so the other extreme would be to think that all voters actually may manipulate simultaneously. Right, and then voting becomes a strategic game. Right, so for each voter, the set of actions are all possible votes they can submit. Right, and if it's a game theoretic setting, it makes sense to think about game theoretic solution concepts. Like a classic one is Nash equilibrium. So Nash equilibrium is a collection of actions, one per player, so that no one wants to change the action given other players' actions. So in the context of voting, Kind of, you don't want to change your vote given how everyone else votes. So you can ask, so suppose you have a voting rule, you have voters' preferences, that induces a voting game. So what are Nash equilibria of that game? Right, so this is a question that has been studied in a bunch of papers. Well, some of them mine, some of them by other people. Right, so what are Nash equilibria in voting? Typically, it's studied for plurality rule because it's complex enough even for plurality. Right, it's because of these strategic interactions. So there are some people that exploit further rules, but I mean, even for plurality, it's interesting. So let me show you, okay, let me start by showing you a counterintuitive example. So suppose you have a bunch of voters, lots of voters, they all agree that candidates should be ranked as A to B, et cetera, to Z. Z is ranked last by everyone. 
everyone voting for Z is a Nash equilibrium, right? What the definition of Nash equilibrium? No one unilaterally can, can improve the situation for themselves by changing the action. Okay, so now if a, bunch, if a bunch of your friends, and there's a lot of them, are all voting for Z, right, then even if you go ahead and vote for A, that's not going to change the plurality outcome. Z is still the plurality winner. Right? So this means collectively being stuck in a very bad outcome. And okay, so if it's quite like that, it's unrealistic, of course, but you can still have situations where voters, for some reason, coordinate on an alternative that is not great, and no one can unilaterally change it. Right, so, okay, so this specific example is not realistic, but it points out an interesting phenomena. So voters collectively may be stuck in a bad equilibrium. And bad may mean really, really bad. Okay, so what are ways out of it? I mean, should we just abandon this idea of game theoretic analysis? Well, there are ways people deal with this. So there are some approaches, so there are some approaches kind of to modify voters' utilities to say that, no, this is actually not going to happen. So here is one, laziness helps. Suppose that you assume that your voters are lazy, lazy in the following sense. If you know that your action is not pivotal, you're just not going to go and vote. So if by voting you can change the outcome, even in a tiny little bit, maybe you can change it from your fifth worst candidate to your fourth worst candidate, right? that's worth it to you. If you can change it into from one tie to another and the difference between these ties is small, that's still worth it to you. But if no matter how you vote, your vote has no impact whatsoever, you might as well not vote. Right, so there's like a tiny little cost to you, right, and you prefer not to incur this cost if it literally doesn't change anything. So suppose you're lazy in that sense, you know, slightly lazy. You're willing to do things if they have any, ch any impact, but you're, but you're not willing to move if there's no impact. But then the bad equilibrium disappears, right? So why is this no longer an Nash equilibrium? Okay. Anyone? So there's a bunch of them, all, they all hate Z, and they go all out and vote for Z. Why does it not make sense if they're lazy? Yeah, they might as well stay home, right? So there's a bunch of, so each of these voters reasons, okay. So there's a bunch of us all voting for Z. If I, don't, if I individually don't go to the election booth, nothing changes, Z still wins. Right, so I might as well stay home. Right, so this is not a Nash equilibrium. Right? But what is a Nash equilibrium now is one guy voting for A, the most preferred candidate, and no one else voting, right? So this is a slightly weird Nash equilibrium because the winner only gets one vote, right? But this is still a Nash equilibrium. And by the way, one guy voting for Z and everyone else not voting is not a Nash equilibrium. Why? Yeah. Because voters are lazy. Right, and when I say voters are lazy, they prefer to stay home when they have no impact. Right, so in any individual voter has no impact. Any individual voter can reason, okay, if I, if I stay home and not vote, I save the effort of voting and the outcome is still Z. So I have no impact, so I'm not going to vote. So are you saying that this will not happen? That will not happen. Okay, so at least that's unlikely to happen. If voters can reason about others' actions, this is not likely to happen. That's not a Nash equilibrium under this additional assumption. If I assume that voters' utilities, if I assume that voters have a small cost for voting, then this is not a Nash equilibrium because changing from Z to not voting is a beneficial deviation, right? Because you actually have a utility for not voting. No, also not a Nash equilibrium, right? But actually, you can ask, so, okay, so what happens if one voter votes for Z and everyone else abstains? Is that a Nash equilibrium? No, because you, well, any of the non-voters, okay, for one, for one thing, the Z voter may ask themselves, okay, so now I'm the only person who votes, why the hell am I voting for Z? Right, so that's one deviation. And the other deviation is one of the non-voters says, okay, there's, one, there's this one idiot voting for Z, but I can actually come in, vote for A and make a difference, change things from a Z to a tie between A and Z, that's already an improvement, right? So that's not an equilibrium, but voting for A in this specific situation is. So laziness helps. So let me show you one more thing that helps, right? And this is perhaps even more plausible than laziness. So here voters say, voters prefer to vote truthfully. Okay, so voters may be strategic, they're willing to strategize even if it makes, yeah, again. Uh, 
Ah, OK. So suppose you change from A to empty set, right? So then no one votes. And you're right that I didn't, even ex didn't really explain what happens when no one votes. So we can say that if no one votes, there is a tie among everyone, so the winner is chosen randomly. Right? So if you can actually make the best guy win, that's preferable to choosing randomly. But yeah, that's a legitimate question because I didn't explain what happens. Good point. Okay, so now truth biased voters. So suppose now abstention is not even an option, so voting is mandatory, but voters are like this. So they say, okay, so I'll manipulate if that can actually improve the election outcome. I'm strategic, I'm capable of reasoning about election outcomes, so I'm willing to, I'm willing to manipulate. But frankly, if I am not pivotal, if this clever manipulation is not going, not, going, not going to accomplish me anything, I'd rather vote truthfully. Right? I'd rather not bother computing this complicated manipulation if I have no impact whatsoever. Right? So then I'll go, I'll go and vote. Right? Voting is mandatory, but I'll vote truthfully. Right? Because why manipulate if there is no reason? And then again, voting, so this, this Nash equilibrium disintegrates. Right? Because now each of these guys thinks, okay, so I'm manipulating for no good reason. Right? So Z is winning, my vote has no impact, I might as well just vote for my preferred alternative A, get more satisfaction out of it. Right? So that's not, not, not a Nash equilibrium. Uh, and, but in contrast, everyone voting for their top alternative actually is, at least in this specific example. Right? So truth bias also helps. Right? Okay, so this is like a you know, very extreme situation when all voters are actually perfectly aligned. Right? So if you have an actual election with diverse voter opinions, so it's an interesting question, what happens with lazy voters and what happens with truth bias voters? What kind of national equilibrium you get? And the picture is not quite as rosy. So I have one slide where I have a characterization. Okay, I have two slides where I have a characterization of national equilibrium with lazy voters and randomized tie breaking. But perhaps since we're already slightly over time, maybe I'm not going to cover that. So we might as well stop. But yeah, so the papers that actually characterize what shape kind of Nash equilibria take for lazy and truth biased voters for randomized tie breaking or lexicographic tie breaking. Right? And it's a pretty rich and interesting picture. Right? So this is like a sequence of well, three, four papers by myself, Svetlana Brastova, a bunch of other courses. So I can give you pointers if you're interested. Okay, so let me stop here and in the afternoon we'll talk about a very different topic about restricted preference domains.